I am very happy to introduce again one of my friends, Dr. Mira. Uh, I, her middle name or her second to the last name, Vula Tovic, I don't always get, but I do get the Dan Danilo Danilovich usually. Uh, Mira is a great friend. I've worked with her several times, uh, met at conferences on different programs. Uh, she's just a great, great person to be around. She is the West Virginia State Master Gardener Volunteer Program Coordinator and Monitor Part uh, there in West Virginia. Mira has been seven years in West Virginia, but 20 years in MS at MSU and Extension uh, up in Michigan State. Now that's the good Michigan, Michigan State, not the other Michigan up there. Uh, Mira's hobbies include traveling and photography. She was born in Serbia and she's been in the United States for 40 years, but she wouldn't tell us when she came to uh, the United States, so she's not sharing that information. She loves to play classical music. And when I asked her what she played, she plays the accordion. So how cool is that? I know somebody now who plays the accordion. So Mira, that's awesome. I'm so glad to learn more about you. And I am going to stop sharing and turn it over to you. Welcome, Mira. Thank you, Pam. That was a great introduction. I'm really happy to be here and to uh, uh, let you in on a, on a little bit of my previous work or work in my uh, previous life up in Michigan State. Um, I'm going to be sharing my, uh, my screen. Okay, it won't allow me, it says only host. Denise, can you double check to make sure that uh, Mira is set up for sharing the screen? Denise? She was co-host, now I've made her host. Well, okay, let's see. That means I'm gonna have uh, a problem. Okay. All right. There no, we we're fine. Got it? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. Let me just... All right. Well, today we're going to be talking about the fire bite, which is a, a, a nasty disease, and I always tell my people that uh, this is something you really do not want to have in your garden. You don't even want to see it any place, not just in your garden. And um, it is uh, a, a bacterial disease. Let me see. No, this is the, doesn't want to advance. Hold on a second. Mira, is your, is your cursor on the screen where your actual um, PowerPoint is and yes. not on your... Yes. It does not want to go. Let me shut this um, camera maybe. I can't get into it either. Uh, let's see, stop sharing. Oh, here we go. Can you see that? No. No. All right. Let me go. Okay, we got your screen. Now only if I can advance it. Now you're sharing. Okay, here. There you go, there you go, perfect. Now we're in business. <laughs> now, what is fire blight? You know, people that are not uh, familiar with it, you know, often ask, you know, what kind of a disease is it? 
Well, it is a, a bacterial disease, and at that, it is very contagious, and it is very destructive. This is the one that will kill the tree or the shrub. And uh, uh, here you see on this particular slide, we have some, you know, apples and pears and quince and, and uh, a few other representatives from rosacea family. So here you have service berry. And uh, if you haven't known up till this point, this is one that in Michigan, they're starting a new industry. They're growing service berries to use as, uh, as a fruit. Then you have uh, the um, mountain ash here. Uh, that one suffers from uh, uh, fire blight tremendously, pyrocantha and cotoneaster. So these are just a few representatives of a rosacea family that do have uh, problems with fire blight. Now, <clears throat> uh, the um, uh, disease cycle, and the epidemiology of this disease, it starts actually with the old cankers. And here at the top left corner, uh, you have some old cankers um, filled with bacteria that overwinters in those sites. It could also overwinter in some of the one-year-old uh, um, cankers, but this is uh, uh, relatively small percentage compared to how um, many overwintery sites are actually in the old canker. So uh, having said that, it is one of the major thing to um, uh, get rid of them in order to prevent some of these um, uh, infections in a, in, a, in a future. So early in spring, uh, once we have a little bit more water and the tissue starts to uh, uh, get that moisture through, those cankers uh, become soft, wet, kind of mushy. And at the margins of these cankers, this is where uh, the bacteria is more prevalent. And it is at that point that is um, ready to be transferred and discharged throughout the vicinity of that particular uh, tree and from there throughout the orchard. So the bacteria itself is kind of elongated and it's spread by the wind, uh, by uh, the um, uh, insects, could be spread by us when we are doing some pruning or even just touching around and uh, not disinfecting our fingers and touching the healthy tissue. So this is enough to transfer some of the bacteria on that healthy tissue. So this is how the primary uh, uh, infection starts, transferring that uh, bacteria. And one of the most important uh, uh, periods in the tree's development during that blossom phase or blossom epiphytic phase. What that means is that um, bacteria gets on the surface of stigma and uh, during the hot weather accumulates there and all that is needed at that point is some moisture and from there that bacteria is flushed down uh, into the, the uh, flower and uh, at the bottom of the pistol, uh, at the neck to those, this is where the infection starts. In about a week or so, depends again on the temperature. If the temperature is high, it takes uh, as little as uh, three, four days. But if the temperature starts, cools down after the infection, that bacteria can linger around for, for uh, a couple, three weeks before the symptoms appear. But usually, if everything goes um, right with the weather, meaning that the, the, the weather is warm, you'll see your flowers collapsing like, like this. They're going to turn brown, and they're going to shrivel up, and they're just going to look very sorry, like, uh, like in this picture. Um, if it is very humid, from there on, 
you have the bacteria present already here in, um, in that spur. And it is going to uh, translocate. And if it's really humid at the time, you're going to see some of these bacterial ooze. You see those little droplets here too. At the beginning of the first day or two, uh, this droplet is kind of whitish. And as it's exposed to the air, and it stays there for a prolonged period of time, it turns amber like what we have here. I cut through this spur where we had that uh, blossom and you see all these browning, that means that that bacteria colonized the xylem and it's moving downward into the healthy tissue. And from there on, it's going to move into the fruits as well. And here you see all this that looks like little bumps, peppered like. So this is the bacterial ooze on the little fruitlet itself. And this wet um, appearance on this uh, uh, branch is also the bacteria that is present in a tissue itself. This would be a uh, part where the secondary infection starts. Basically, the primary is in a blossom blight, and from blossom blight, since already have the bacteria present, from there it spreads through the rest of the tissues, and so this is the secondary blight. Now, from there, it um, uh, spreads throughout the tree, and usually the most susceptible tissue is uh, the newly expanding tissue. So the tip of your uh, uh, shoots are going to be the most susceptible. And you see here the typical, very typical symptom of that shepherd's crook. And that's a sure sign that you do have the bacteria present in that particular tree or in this whole orchard. Here you see just a part of the orchard and all these brown strikes, as they call them, are actually showing you that you have a severe um, disease presence in this particular orchard. Now, as far as the tools to predict infections, we are lucky that we live in a period that we do because since um, the late 80s, early 90s, um, there people came up with the several tools to predict that particular disease. Uh, Mary Blight is one of the very first and it's uh, been developed by uh, Paul Steiner and um, uh, Leitner from University of Maryland. And this is the one that we used way back when, when we uh, didn't have the windows yet, but operated off the DOS system. Cougar blight is uh, relatively newer, but this is the one that I haven't used. Mary blight is the one that I still heavily depend on. And being with Michigan State, as you heard, I was there for 20 years and uh, IPM, and of course, uh, taking care of the commercial orchards, uh, providing technical support for them. That was one of my primary responsibilities to monitor and give them heads up, basically do the pre disease prediction so that they can uh, act appropriately, meaning that they need to put, if they need Uh, Mira, we with wet, uh, wet resistance. Yes, Mira, we lost your video or your audio, so I'm not sure what happened there. Oh, I don't know. Let me see. You still don't have the. No, we got your audio now. Okay. All right. I will just have to talk into my microphone. <laughs> um. As I said, you know, part of my main responsibilities was to uh, do the disease prediction so that people would be aware of it and act appropriately to uh, cover their 
um, uh, orchards so they do not have the problem with that particular disease. Now, this is uh, a picture of a site and I took this picture uh, just a few days ago, like on the 9th. And if you look at here, they give you the date, they give you the minimum temperature, the maximum, the average temperature, uh, the rain, do fog spray. If you had the spray uh, just before um, uh, the uh, potential infection, everything kind of zeroes out and starts all over again. Then we have the hours of wetness, hours of um, um, uh, leaf wetness recorded at apples 40 inches above the ground and so forth. So we have the degree days. And this particular model is driven by the uh, uh, degrees or the temperatures above 60, 65 degrees. And the threshold is actually the degree hour accumulation for the day. So uh, base is 65 and you have, the research has uh, shown that accumulation of 198 degree hours base 65 is needed to have reached the level of bacteria on the stigma to present the a significant threat of infection. So uh, if you look at this chart, you have to have all four of these requirements satisfied. So you have to have the open blossoms, you have to have the epiphytic infection potential that's here. It has to be over that threshold and I told you how threshold is developed. So the threshold has to be 100. And if you have uh, the uh, wetting event and you have the temperatures above 65 degrees or the average should be above 60 and um, you have the progress to, uh, towards uh, uh, the risk of infection and the progress towards the symptoms if the infection had occurred. So if you look here, on the, let's see, Monday the 25th, we had the maximum temperature of 81, which is absolute optimum for this particular disease to develop. The average temperature was high, 71. Uh, didn't have any rain. So the um, uh, epiphytic potential is 149. So it is 49 above 100. So it is above the threshold. And uh, the degree hours are 192. So you had all three except the wetting event. So the potential for the infection is very high. And at this point, my recommendation would be, yeah, we have all of this. All we need is uh, either heavy dew or uh, we need to have like a, a, a high humidity or if they're calling for rain, this is infection that is definitely going to happen. So you need to put something on. And of course, it is always prevention over cure. And at this, this point, you know, again, taking in consideration the um, uh, previous infections or how, what type of uh, uh, cultivars that orchard has or your garden, uh, whether those, um, uh, cultivars are a little bit more resistant or tolerant to uh, uh, fire blight or they're highly susceptible. All of this is going to pay, play a major role in determining what type of material you're going to apply to prevent that infection from happening. Now, this other one, I just wanted to show you how many infections you had here. There is infection one, two, three in a row. So again, when you look at the temperatures here where you had the infections, you had 82 maximum, 79, 77. The averages were all above 65. And you had the wetting uh, events that were from one hour to five hours long. And of course, the epiphytic uh, infection potential was always above 100. So here, even it was just three above 100. But
but you did have an infection because of the high temperature and you had enough moisture to drive that uh, uh, bacteria down into the flower and to cause that infection uh, to happen. Here again, we had extremely high epiphytic potential, 211, but we did not have any wetting event. So we did not have an infection, even though it was very high potential for the infection. One more thing I need to mention here is if what happens if we have a cool day? We had, let's say, very high potential for infection, but the next day, up oh, temperature dropped down like it did here, 62, and then the average was only 54. Well, if we have just that one cool day, the uh, potential for infection or that epiphytic uh, infection potential is reduced by one third. If you have two days in a row with that, it's two thirds. After three days of cool temperatures, like uh, this one here, 59, 47, 62, like what we had here, it basically uh, starts from zero again. And uh, then the next day, like we had here, a uh, high temperature is so uh, you were counting again degree hours above 65 and we accumulated 103 here. So we did have all four requirements here satisfied. We had the open blossoms. We had uh, the epiphytic infection potential above threshold. We had the wetting event and we had high temperatures. So we did have infection that actually occurred. Now, uh, let's see. Again, just wanted to uh, emphasize that from King Blossom, as long as you have the open flowers till petal fall, this is your critical uh, infection period or potential for the infections during the open blossoms. Once the uh, petal fall starts, you're out of it. Old cankers could be, you see here when, when the pruning was done, this one was missed. It wasn't pruned far enough. You have to cut 12 to 18 inches below the visible margin of a canker. Look at it. This is even going further down. So that should have been cut down way, way back, probably close to the trunk and not left here to spread. Um, this branch definitely has it. This one, you see it's already dead. That one had it. So all of this is like right now um, source of infection for you. There is one that is right here into uh, um, on the trunk. So what is person to do when it has the situation like this? If you have any other trees that are very highly susceptible to fire blight, my recommendation is to cut it, make one cut, and that cut should be way down at the base of a tree at the ground level. So you remove it. Once you remove all of this, do not set it aside so you can use it as a, as a firewood. Uh, firewood. Do not put any of the smaller branches on your brush pile. You're preserving the inoculum near to your orchard or your uh, garden. So the best way to deal with it is just to cut it out and remove it. What they do in commercial orchards where you have hundreds of acres, they cannot easily just remove all that wood and, and take it out of the orchard. What they do when they do that pruning in, in winter time, they use that chopper, the uh, flare mower, and they um, basically chop it up so fine and they put a little bit of uh, urea on to induce the very fast decomposition of, of that wood. So that's how they do it. Another source of inoc inoculum here, you see um, mummified fruit. So this 
this one is going to be laden with bacteria as well in the stem here and at the base here probably this hole should here up to as i said 12 to 18 inches below the visible symptom so when we are pruning we need to remove all of this out and try not to miss any of it here I want you to recognize the symptoms of bacterial mold. There is your blossom blight here. And I cut through and I showed you how it moves through xylem and through the other tissue. Well, here it moves also through the uh, xylem of the, of the stem and goes into the leaf. And look at it. it, it goes through the midrib and then it starts this browning and uh, dying and the whole leaf looks like it was burned. So that's why we call it like a fire blight because it is blighted, it, it, it spreads like a wildfire. There it is here, now you can see this a little bit better. You see all these browning, so this is filled with bacteria and when you um, touch it, it is sticky and uh, um, it, it, it is sweet and there's some sugars in it as well. Bacteria likes that, that sugar, but the insects like it too. And so the insects are attracted to it and they come there and then as they're moving around, they're spreading it. Here you see the whole branches uh, latent by bacteria. Uh, right here. You see this spur is that, this one is that, this one is that, this one here too. This one hasn't died yet, but look at it. You see this browning already here along the stem and here the midrib. The bacteria has spread already into the leaf surface and so this is going to turn like this in, in, in uh, a relatively short period of time. Here on the new shoot, those uh, brand new leaves, they're just expanding as the most susceptible. And here you see through that young shoot, there is some bacteria loose. Here we have even this new, new uh, leaflet is already infected. Some of the older leaves are already infected. So the whole thing, there is the beginning of that shepherd's crook forming. The whole new shoot is going to uh, turn brown. Here again, I just want to uh, show that bacteria lose, how it spreads. Look at it here, here, here a little bit more. It goes actually from, if you have, uh, this is the rootstock. And in this particular case, we don't have the bacteria above. So the sign was obviously resistant or highly tolerant to, to uh, bacteria, but the rootstock is highly susceptible and the rootstock got infected and being in Michigan that's not very difficult you know especially on the west side of the state where I was and uh, with all that sand we had high winds often time and so it was like sandblasting so that would open up all these little wounds and make it really easy for bacteria to move in and colonize that tissue. So if your rootstock gets killed by um, the bacteria, the whole tree is going to die. Even though you might have red delicious, which is highly resistant to it. And um, I am, I couldn't find that picture, but I remember seeing it, our professor, Dr. Um, <clears throat> Ellen Jones, back in the 90s, we had some severe outbreak of um, uh, fire blight in, in uh, southwest Michigan. And it was an aerial picture of a large area. Every single orchard was brown and only one green spot in, in the sea of dead trees. And that was red delicious. The only cultivar that survived. Even if you have that, but you have, let's say, M26, which is highly susceptible rootstock, 
that orchard too is going to be dead. So this is, I showed you this, and they, this is that orchard. This is Rod Island Greening, apple orchard, old orchard, and uh, they didn't spray any streptomycin on it. They didn't really provide much of a control. And if you look at it, it's, it's uh, very vigorous, uh, not much of a pruning done there either. So this is the end result of it. That whole orchard was just uh, peppered with these uh, uh, fire blight strikes uh, to the point that they could not have marketable fruit and the next step was just taking it out. So these are very easy to mix, uh, miss. You see, this is a, a relatively new orchard. Uh, that's another one. I took these pictures um, in uh, August. We had, um, this is the only canker in that block that we could find after the damage has been done. Um, I got some, some uh, pears brought into my office and they were looking like this and like this when I went out there and I saw this. And uh, uh, the guy says, hey, don't look so happy. I says, you know what? I can empathize with uh, your loss and I'm really sorry for it, but I've been waiting for 30 years to see something like this. And so this was uh, really a very unique situation. I have never seen anything so bad in one spot. Uh, this is what 25% of his fruit looked like. So he says, what am I going to do? I says, well, this is something that is unproven. I don't have anything uh, to tell you, but it's not going to hurt much except your pocketbook. But if you want to try to preserve some of the fruits that you still have, spray serenade on it. Get rid of all this fruit, pick it, pull it out of the orchard, and then definitely spray serenade. So he did. And... Uh, he was able to um, uh, sell that fruit. He was able to uh, prevent that from spreading any further. But each time, as I said, he, we were monitoring uh, very closely what Mary Blight was telling us. And uh, each time he had moderate to high infection potential, we would go in and put the serenade on. How serenade works, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself for a little bit here, but uh, you might have that question right now, so I'm going to address it. Um, the serenade is one of the biologicals. It's uh, another bacteria. It's Bacillus uh, subtilis. And this one occupies the same sites as um, Ervinia armillovera, which is the bad, bad guy in this case. And it's basically site is occupied and Ervinia does not have any room to move in. So this is a sort of uh, um, how that thing works. And again, just a close up of this to see all these droplets of bacterial ooze on this fruit. The, uh, I forgot to tell you the, uh, the story behind um, and before this happened, it was um, July 30th, 31st, we had some tremendous uh, wind uh, in the area at the time. And so that created that trauma blight I was telling you about. And we already had some strikes here and there, of course, being the uh, Bartlett, very susceptible cultivar. So we had a few strikes in, in the orchard already and it didn't take very long till we had that uh, secondary infection. We also had another thing, the red tail bloom and pears are notorious for it. You have that late bloom that really creates a, a lot of problem for people. Then you have to spray again and protect your whole block just because of a few flowers that are still present in, in July and August. So by August, 
uh, only about three, three days, three, four days after that um, uh, initial infection, we had this showing up. Now, what to do about fire blight? How do we control it? How do we manage it? First of all, and for us as homeowners, plant resistant varieties. You see Red Delicious is number one here. You, I'm not a fan of Red Delicious, but Enterprise is great. Gold Rush, Wolf River. So these are just a few, and I have a bunch of other varieties that you will see in a few other slides just following this one. Avoid, I know many people love Honeycrisp and I'm one of those, but I would opt to buy this one rather than to grow it. Golden Delicious has some sensitivity to fire blight. And when you have optimal conditions it, and you have high pressure, it will show significant um, presence of fire blight within it. Macintosh, avoid that one. And especially Gala, Fuji, Braeburn. These are the poster kids for, for this particular disease. Um, the only Fuji exception is that early Fuji that uh, ripens in September, and that one has some tolerance to, to it. But the original Fuji, as I said, stay away from it. It is a poster child for uh, fire blight. Sanitation is very, very important here. You see what that one missed canker um, was uh, able to do, basically provided inoculum for the whole orchard. So we need to prune all the limbs, remove all the cankers and prune 12 to 18, and I would recommend 18 inches below the visible margin of that particular canker. And part of the culture management is reduce the nitrogen rate, um, especially if you have done all that kink remover. So that, that means you had done some very heavy pruning. Following that heavy pruning, just stay away from nitrogen fertilizer, period. Uh, your trees are not gonna starve. Uh, reduce that or eliminate it for a year or two after pr that severe pruning, and then you can ease into it. And um, if you are feeding this, what happens after severe pruning? You have all the water sprouts coming up, so it's very strong vegetative response. And so all these water sprouts, they go straight up, they're very vigorous, they're growing really like weeds, and they're very susceptible to fire blight. So to reduce that, um, you just cut down on that nitrogen or eliminate it, and um, you have better chance of controlling it. So when we're, this is probably the best advice I can give you. Start early, looking for cankers, prune them completely out during the dormant period. Copper sprays, there is a bunch of copper compounds here that you can, um, or materials that you can use. Spray it early in the season, uh, in a delayed dormant, dormant, delayed dormant, maybe if you can swing it, a couple of sprays in, um, uh, on, on the trees that are susceptible to fire blight before you have quarter inch green. Why am I saying this? The quarter inch green is sort of like a threshold. Um, copper is phytotoxic. So if you have more green showing than one quarter inch, you're going to have burn. So in order to prevent that burn, you do it early. And during the blossom time, as long as you have open flowers, we start with about uh, five, 10, 20%, 40, 50%. Again, you follow uh, the uh, weather conditions. If the weather is going to be warm, so your flowers are going to open up faster during that warm period and your bacterial growth is going to be faster during that uh, warm period. So you really need to um, uh, cover it all through bloom 
you need to apply let me go back for a minute oh um you need to apply streptomycin which comes under the name of agrimycin there is another one like kasugamitin or kasugan and there is a firewall uh, and they, there is uh, this serenade, which is basically like um, uh, uh, one of the bo uh, botanicals. There are a few other newer materials that you can buy right now. Um, there is oxytetracycline. You see, the com but streptomycin and oxytetracycline are um, uh, primarily uh, the materials that um, come into play, you know, when you have a commercial orchard. Uh, first of all, it's very expensive. Secondly, you know, you um, uh, have to be really careful so you don't have uh, issues with resistance development. Um, the, in Michigan, there are quite a few orchards that are totally resistant, or bacteria in those orchards is totally resistant to streptomycin, even though if you have the susceptible uh, bacteria to strep, strep is the best material to use. But if you have resistance to strep, then second best would be your, your oxytetracycline or microshield flame out, fire lane, and so forth. These are some of the trade names. Serenade is Bacillus subtilis, and there is um, a, a newer material that is basically like a yeast, and again, works the same way as I explained for serenade by occupying the same sites where uh, Erbinia would go, and so it prevents it from uh, colonizing first of all, stigma, and then flushing down into the flower and causing infection. Now for the mid-season control, what do we do? Basically, the best thing is to get those strikes out. On one hand, I told you do not prune, don't make, do not make any cuts when bacteria is present in your orchard. Now on the other hand, I'm telling you remove it. But if I'm telling you to remove it, it's a valid advice. Do not cut it all the way 12 or 18 inches below the symptoms. You actually want just to remove those shoots that carry the inoculum at the present. Have like a spray can with some really um, neon type of a color. I like that neon yellow uh, or orange, something that is going to stand out in winter time when you don't have any, any um, uh, leaves around. And so you're going to see that. And this is the color you're gonna be looking for to finish your removal of that infected shoot or limb. And at that time, in winter time, during the dormant season, you're going to make that cut 12 to 18 inches below. So once uh, uh, the new season starts and everything starts to come to life, um, you're not going to have that bacteria within the tissue at, at that point. And hopefully you did your early sprays with copper Copper is great bactericide. It's also great fungicide. So these couple early sprays during the dormant or delayed dormant period will also uh, give you your first cover for the other fungal diseases that might happen, not necessarily just fire blight, even though your fire blight is the primary objective of that particular spray. Remove all these clippings, you know, when you're doing this right now. Uh, I just talked to somebody, one of my scouts from Michigan called me yesterday, says, oh my God, we have fire blight galore. What do we do now? So this is what I told her. Just recommend removal of these uh, active um, uh, shoots with active bacteria. Uh, have a garbage bag and put all the clippings in it. 
and uh, do not put them in a compost pile or do not leave it in the orchard. After each cut, you definitely need to disinfect your pruners. You can use 70% rubbing alcohol or you can make a 10% bleach solution and do it that way too. I know many people don't like uh, bleach just because it's very corrosive, but you can use alcohol. That is a um, uh, very good disinfectant. Another thing what we need to do if we have a really severe uh, uh, um, breakout of, of um, uh, fire blight is control all these possible or potential vectors. So you have your insects, particularly piercing, sucking. Uh, they're going to create all these little holes in tissue and create these entry po points for bacteria that is already present within the, the tree or within the orchard. And um, uh, so that's going to be very, very important. If so, it should happen that we have a, a windstorm uh, that breaks the limbs and or we have uh, or live in the area, there's a lot of sand and stuff. And so you have a sand blasting event. Immediately, immediately after that's done, go back in and spray streptomycin if it's still valid to use, or you can use some of these other materials I mentioned in order to kill the bacteria that is trying to reach into the tissue and move into it. So this is something that requires immediate action. Within the 24 hours of the event that occurred, that will be successful application. If you wait more than 24 hours, nothing. It's just spray strap or spray water. It's gonna be the same effect. Shoot blight control. There is one one way that we can we can do it. And so this is um, applying this apogee, which is prohexodyne calcium. And uh, what this does, it slows down the growth. And if you remember, I already mentioned the actively and strong uh, I mean, the actively expanding shoots, particularly very robust shoots and very vigorous shoots, vigorous growth, is gonna be more susceptible to fire blight attacks. So again, through research, we found out that if we put this apogee or prohexodyne calcium, this is going to slow the growth. And by doing so, it's going to play a really a major role in slowing down and preventing the infection. So a colleague of mine from Michigan State, Phil Schwalier, did this trial back in 2000 and 2001, and he found out that um, uh, the growth could be suppressed anywhere between 40 and uh, um, uh, about 80% in certain cultivars. So. As you can see here, there is your uh, uh, untreated control. This is Cortland. And this is about 50% or so reduction in growth. And when do you apply this? You apply it um, at the first king bloom. And this is that uh, first flower that opens up in the cluster. Usually it's the best developed. And this is the one you want to preserve the fruit from. It's always going to be the largest, the strongest, the best. So once the first one opens up, it's, it's open for a bacteria to colonize it. So you gotta spray it, you gotta reduce it. And um, um, you, um, you know, can apply just one application. As I said, you know, the first application is at, at the King Bloom uh, uh, Petal Fall. And uh, it, if it's just one application, it will grow out of it. So in order to uh, have a constant reduction in growth, you can apply two, three, or four applications. Now, how many 
applications you're going to go with depends on uh, how vigorous the, the cultivar is and uh, what the crop was uh, previous years. If it was a um, uh, light crop, that means the tree is very vigorous. So you're going to be applying more often and higher concentration of it. But the first one, as I said, it goes to the king petal fall. Uh, two weeks after that, you go with the second application and then two to three weeks after the second application. So you can go up to four applications, but the maximum amount of um, uh, uh, apogee you can do in one season is 25 ounces. So you'll have to kind of pay attention to that. Um, now, just uh, to give you a few disease resistant varieties or disease, um, not necessarily just resistant, but tolerant. And each one of these has different um, uh, uh, tolerance level. Very early ginger gold looks like, um, um, as you can see, it almost looks like uh, uh, golden delicious. Um, so for uninitiated, would be like a golden delicious. Duchess of Oldenburg is another one early. Then William's Pride, John of Re Wolf River, one of the old varieties. But uh, as I mentioned even before talking about the, the, the uh, scab, for 200 years, nobody really cared for it and it still survives and it doesn't show any symptoms of any, hardly any disease. So it does deserve to be on this list. Now you have Liberty Enterprise, Gold Rush is another one. Um, a little bit about the gold, uh, each one of them. Uh, I, I just um, gave you here the uh, site where you can go and find all these diseases. So this is the Orange Pippin. It's uh, uh, one of the best sites that I could find and it gives you all the research notes, uh, gives you a little bit about the history of this particular um, cultivar that you're looking at and gives you, um, you know, the susceptibility to diseases, when does it uh, ripen, when does it bloom and all this, what you need to know. Um, cross-pollination requirements. So it's, it's really one-stop shop. So if you go to that site, you're going to find all this valuable information. There are a few comments here. You see, um, tree is quite tall. This first one says, you know, 80 plus years old, produces 600, pound, 600 pounds in a good year and 300 when it's uh, dry summer. So it's still very productive. Uh, cultivar and it is one um, that is showing resistance or tolerance to uh, fire blight. Grimes Golden, one of the Golden Delicious parents. It's uh, very sweet and what it says here, super sweet with high sugar content and blasts of banana and anise flavors. It, become, it became the uh, favorite of moonshiners and children alike. And why do they like it? Because of the high sugar content. So <laughs> this is one to have in the garden for sure. Okay, Gold Rush, it's one of the newer uh, cultivars, uh, very late, November, very good for many things. So this is another um, interesting um, spread here. And if you look down here, what is it? It's orange pippin trees. So you go there and it's going to give you, you know, what is it good for? When does it ripen and all of this kind of stuff? Pollination group four, that means it's kind of uh, early, late season bloom period. Um, so I basically pulled all of these for you, but I'm not going to go over every single one. I just wanted you to be aware of, uh, of this particular site. And these are all the uh, fire blight, highly tolerant or moderately tolerant um, apples that they do have on this particular site. Noah's pie is one of the uh, earlier, I mean, um, newer uh, spy varieties. It's an improved form of northern spy. So you know that northern spy is really good apple, particularly for baking. And this one is part of uh, all these pie fields, pretty much. Um, you have 
know the spy in it, but this Nova spy, it has a, a beautiful red color and yet it has improved tolerance to um, um, fire blight. While your Northern Spite is very susceptible, this one is showing tolerance to it. Um, so you have that. And Zestar is one of these um, uh, very, uh, um, when it comes to winter hardness, it's uh, winter hardy. It's one of the uh, Minnesota varieties. It's a summer apple, uh, very good tasting, keeps for a couple weeks or so, um, through weeks in a cooler, and um, a really nice, um, nice uh, uh, cultivar to have. Um, so that's, again, one of the early ones to be considered. Uh, if you're looking into uh, the crab apples, you have Whitney crab, chestnut crab, shows some tolerance to it. Uh, under the optimum conditions for disease uh, development, it might show some symptoms, but it's, uh, it's generally thought of as, uh, as a tolerant variety. And the dolgo is another crab apple that um, has very good... Uh, uh, resistance to uh, both scab and fire blight. Some of the useful links, you can find a lot about uh, uh, the um, what materials you can use, when to spray it, uh, pest management guide, home um, gardeners, and, and uh, basically it's home grounds and animals. So uh, again, a lot of recommendations. And there is uh, another one uh, Midwest Fruit Management Guide. So it's going to give you both um, uh, commercial and um, uh, home or organic recommendations for uh, disease control in general, and of course for uh, fire blight here too. And with that, I will uh, open up this discussion for questions. Ah, thank you, Mira. That was fascinating. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, how long do some of these trees last age-wise? All these apples can live a couple hundred years. Yeah, you know, biological uh, lifespan. Okay. But let me let me get out of this presentation. <laughs> okay. And I put the orange pippin in the chat box. It was just o a r n g e p i p p i n dot com. Yeah, mm -hmm. that should get people there. Great. Okay, we have some questions. Okay. My one apple tree has not bloomed much the last few years, and the leaves are starting to curl and turn yellow and fall. It doesn't look like fire blight on my pear tree. Is this something else? Yeah, on your pear tree, um, they have. Uh, some other other issues. They have another uh, bacterial disease that um, mimics fire blight, um, and it's referred to as um, a blossom blast. And that's a different type of bacteria. It's Pseudomonas syringia. Uh, but what you're describing here, that's not the case. Uh, I would suspect that you have issues with. Um, uh, a fungal disease. It could be scab or the combination of scab and another fungal disease, Fabria. So both will uh, cause some uh, lesions on the leaves, uh, yellowing of the leaves, and drop off of the leaves. As a matter of fact, I just recently received one um, picture and uh, the pear tree was totally defoliated. Oh so what you can do about it is basically spray early. Right now, there is no use for spraying anything. The damage has been done. Um, but early in spraying, at that delay dormant, you're going to start spraying. Put some. Start with copper spray first, and then after that, you're going to be using either... Um, Cap 10, that's pretty much universal um, fungicide, but it has to be sprayed before 
the potential for the infection. So before the rain, you have to apply that. Captain creates like a film on the leaves. So when the spores hit that surface, they're not going to be able to penetrate. And so there's no infection. So that's how it works. And that's why we call them protectants. Um, if you haven't done that prior to infection and you need to go in and put some uh, something you know, to, to uh, uh, arrest the infection in progress, then you're gonna go with some mycobutanil, which is a sterile inhibitor. And this is the one that works, but again, you have to be cautious when applying it because the fungi will develop resistant to it. And uh, then you're gonna lose that particular material. So you can have um, um, uh, or you can spray another stuff, like if you're more um, organically inclined, um, there's some um, uh, like uh, basically baking soda type, <laughs> you know, and you spray that, it, it, it's a Kali green. And that, that's one of the trade names for it. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you spray Serenade on just the fruit? No, you spray that on, um, you can spray that um, on, on your, you mean just on fruit trees, fruit shrubs and stuff? I think she means just on the fruit, the, uh, like the pears you showed, did you spray yeah, it on no. the pears? No, that, that wasn't sprayed just on the fruit, that was sprayed actually on the whole tree. What, uh, that, that story I, I gave you was, uh, basically my recommendation was go in and remove all the damaged fruit. And everything that, because it was too early to harvest, he needed to, to have them hanging for another uh, week or, or two. So what they did after they removed all of it, then they went and they spray serenade, but the serenade would have been better sprayed immediately after that um, uh, trauma event, which was uh, basically that high wind. It was 70 mile per hour wind and it just sandblasted everything. And immediately after that wind stopped, they should have gone in and sprayed that serenade or streptomycin or anything, you know, to, to prevent that trauma blight from forming. Oh, thank you. If you lose the tree to fire blight, can you plant another tree in the same place? Yeah, you can. But um, before you plant it, make sure that other tree is, uh, it could be still the apple, it could be still a uh, pear, but if it is uh, a pear, use uh, one of the um, resistant varieties like second, <laughs> or if it is apple, again, use the highly resistant or highly tolerant fire blight cultivar, which is going to be like enterprise. So you're gonna go with, um, um, as I said, you know, ginger gold or, you know, uh, golden grime, uh, Grimes golden, you know, something like that. Okay, thank you. Can fire blight on a pear tree infect an apple tree? Yes, even okay. though it's all palm, you know, so they, they go, it's all Irvinia. Great, okay, we have, um, any information available on effect on pollinators when these products are applied to flowering trees? That shouldn't really affect them. Uh, but, you know, one thing is shouldn't, the other thing is, you know, what's actually happening. <laughs> uh, through the experience over my 40 some years working with the uh, fruit industry, I haven't seen any uh, negative effects on pollinators. Okay. Um, and when they're spraying that, usually they spray at night. So this is when the pollinators are not around. And my and recommendation for the homeowners would be to spray before, um, not before, but before the, the event, but after the sundown, you know, after the pollinators are kind of went to belly by. <laughs> okay. And there wouldn't be any residual effect of the product. No. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Jacqueline wants to know what about pink lady apples? 
Pink lady apples. They uh, do have some sensitivity to it. Okay. So you would really need to uh, go, as I said, you know, go early, spray that copper. And then after that, you know, it, as the flowers start to open up, uh, as the temperature rises, watch closely, you know, what your uh, weather conditions are. If the temperature is above 65, I would recommend putting some something, you know, uh, to uh, prevent colonization of the stigmas. Oh, we've got some compliments on thank you for the excellent handouts and thank you for the order, orderliness of the presentation. Thank um, you. Uh, let's see, we've got one. Is the, is the quince, is there a quince that is resistant to fire blight? Not that I know of. Okay. Um, I lost one uh, at my parents' place back in Europe. We had one that was like about 30, 40 years old. And my sister had to cut it down last year just because it was too much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to go over the last question. Then we've got, um, I'm going to launch the poll. So okay. you take the poll. Um, and the last question um, um, is about how master gardeners feel about going back into the field. Please be um, frank and honest. We really want to know how you're feeling about that. So, Me? No, the Master Gardeners. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. The uh, question we have is, on the service berry tree, there seems to be some webbing. What is it? Uh, right now? Yes. Earlier, and where is the webbing? What kind of a webbing are we talking about? Because you can have some um, webbing that might be caused by the spider mites, but you can also have webbing that might be caused by some uh, caterpillars. If it is in the crotches, then in early in spring, usually like, you know, early May, you, you're talking uh, tent caterpillars. If it starts showing up like in late summer, uh, August and beyond, then you can have the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, fall webworms. She so, says it's a very fine webbing and it's happening now. Very fine webbing. I would probably, I'm inclined to think that you have some um, spider mites. And what do you do to treat those? Depends on how big is uh, the shrub or the tree. If it is relatively small and you don't want to spray, you don't want to spray any chemicals, you can just hose it down. That's how I deal with my spider mites and my um, Alberta spruce. I don't want to put anything on it. But uh, you're basically changing the environment for spider mites. The spider mites love it hot and dry. You can't do much about hot or cold, but you certainly can make it either wet. <laughs> uh, you can make it wet and they don't like it wet. So hose it down just with the water. Again, that hosing down, do it early in the morning. Don't do it at noon and don't do it too late at night because it's going to stay wet for a prolonged period of time. And then you're going to call on some other problems. But if you do it early in the morning, you hose it down, then it's going to dry off. And, and um, definitely you're going to control your mite population because they're not going to love it. <laughs> they you. like it dry. Great. That was wonderful, Mira. Thank you so much. No problem. In the poll, and we'll share the results. Um, let's see. Their level of knowledge before fire, bl before fire blight was, um, let's see, most of them had below average or no knowledge. 9% had above average. Now, mm -hmm. after the webinar, up like 46% have above average, 3% are expert, they were expert before. Uh, and we've really uh, learned something today. Uh, rate the value of this webinar, good to great, excellent is um, 98%. It was a wonderful webinar. And technology um, was agreeable with us today. <laughs> yes. 99% <laughs> um, learned something new from this webinar. 
91% plan to share this knowledge of fire blight with others. And then uh, for the Master Gardener volunteers, they're selecting the best um, phrase that describes them. I'm concerned about working on projects is 13%, slightly concerned 36. 30% um, are very concerned about working on projects following social distance guidelines. Okay, that's good to know because we really want to get a feel for how people are um, feeling about that. Well, Mira, that was wonderful and thank you all for joining us. I know there's everyone's giving you a big round of applause. Thank you. It was just wonderful. Thank you so much, Mira. Thank you. Okay. Have a good one. You too. Have a good weekend. You Bye. too. Bye-bye.